Dr. Richard. Um, did I announce who I was? That was a bit arrogant of me. <laughs> I'm Nikki Banks. I'm the chair of the Criminal Justice Department. Um, we're excited to have you all in our program and look forward to seeing you all uh, in the workforce because we know that you are going to be stellar because we accept nothing less, nothing less. So, um, and, and we look forward to hearing that come out tonight. I'm excited to hear from you guys. Uh, so now I'll turn it over. Hi, I'm Director Jody Richard, and I'm the director of the Police Academy here at GRCC. So how many of you are hoping to get into the law enforcement program? Not the people in the white shirts. You've already made it. <laughs> You're hoping to get out of the law enforcement program. So we, um, we look forward to meeting those of you who are looking forward to getting into our program someday and um, hopefully being like a Sergeant Wachowski up there. Um, so we'd like to thank our panel members for coming and spending their evenings with us. And with that, I will turn it over to Pro Professor Gary Ebels as our moderator for this evening. Good evening. Thanks for everyone. Thanks everyone for coming. Hopefully you can hear me. I'm not going to do a lot of talking. My job is uh, multifold tonight. One is to try to keep this band of uh, whatever they are in line and not talk too much, which um, I think we had probably our best discussion down in the office before we started. So. Sorry we missed it. Um, but uh, let me introduce you to uh, the group that you have up here. We'll start with the uh, with the most recognizable person down there on the end. This is Sergeant John Witkowski. Sergeant Witkowski has been a Grand Rapids police officer for 18 years. And I might add that everyone sitting on stage, not only in their professional um, expertise that we have from the community, they're all um, adjunct instructors here at GRCC. So not only do we get the experts in the field, we actually get them to teach our students, which as Professor Banks said, we accept nothing less. So um, you really got it made. So that's uh, Sergeant Wachowski. Sitting next to um, John is Jan Willis. Jan was the court administrator for the 61st District Court for like a couple of years. And um, <laughs> she is now um, uh, an adjunct and she kind of um, heads up the um, substance abuse or addiction studies program here which seems to be fairly popular. In fact, how many people here are doing something either directly or indirectly in the addiction studies program? Raise your hand. There you go. Job security for you there, Jan. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Next to, uh, to Jan there is uh, Nikki Edwards and Nikki is a corrections officer with the Kent County Sheriff's Department and um, instructor. Don't you also teach for Ferris too sometimes? Okay. Sometimes. So sometimes, yeah. And so she comes from the corrections angle there. Next to Nikki is Clifford Washington. Clifford is currently the director of prisoner reentry programs at Pine Rest and an adjunct instructor here. Steve Brunick here is, uh, to give equal time here, is from the dark side, okay? <laughs> he is an attorney with the Kent County Defender's Office, okay? So if you, he does charge you reasonably afterwards for any talking he does, if you got any, need any advice. Um, but he's from, uh, he's also an adjunct and teaches in our legal, um, legal issues and corrections class. And uh, that's how you'll know him. And then right next to me here is Linnell, Linnell Talbert, and she's a juvenile community corrections probation officer. She is assigned specifically to the southeast side of Grand Rapids, particularly Mark, Martin Luther King area. Does that keep you busy? Very much so, okay. Anyways, but just a, just a quick story um, that I thought of as I was standing up here. I'm gonna really date myself here because this is well before most of you were born, but in 1970, excuse me, and actually 1969, I enlisted in the United States Air Force, and anybody who's been in the Air Force knows you get a free ticket to a place called San Antonio, Texas, Lackland Air Force Base. And I remember every morning I got up and we stood in line to go to breakfast and every morning in the newspaper stand that was sitting next to it, they, they showed the fact that, that somebody had been murdered. There was another murder in San Antonio that night and I'm going, this must be a really bad place. I wake up now in the morning and turn my TV on and very seldom do I have a day that at least one person hasn't been shot, another person has been murdered right here in Grand Rapids and I think to myself, we've graduated or something like that. Um, and so our discussion tonight uh, surrounds violence and we have some scripted questions which we're going to allow the panel to weigh in on based upon their expertises and 
We're also then going to get to a point maybe the, about the third question, second or third, where we're going to open it up to you and we'll have some of these around um, that you can ask your questions so that everybody can hear and weigh in it. Like I said, this is, has to be collaborative. It's not just the experts up here. This is your opportunity also to get those questions asked that you've always wanted to ask here. So um, what we're just going to start out is you want to do ladies first or do you want to defer to the other end? Okay, we're going to go right down the row here. <laughs> Ladies' prerogative, and it is. By the way, just as a, for the record, tomorrow is Valentine's Day. Okay, guys, I know they said they didn't want anything. They lied. Okay, <laughs> moving right along. Here we go. Here's our first question of the night. John, you're first up. How has the recent surge of violence in our community impacted you professionally? Uh, clearly, as a police officer and as a supervisor on third shift in the city of Grand Rapids, um, I do happen to work in the core city where the majority of uh, the recent violence has occurred. Um, Grand Rapids historically averages about 16 to 17 homicides a year. Uh, up until December of last year, we had 11. Uh, in the month of December, if memory serves me correct, we had six alone. Uh, and then we had a couple additional homicides in the beginning of this year. Um, obviously, that puts a strain on resources uh, in the city of Grand Rapids. And dealing with the issue of, uh, of gun violence in our society, and much of the notoriety as of late uh, clearly has been around mass shootings. But I think uh, we don't do ourselves enough justice with respect to the overarching issue of our society, and that's the number one issue attributed to gun violence, and that's single victim homicides. Every year there is uh, 12,000, approximately 12,000 single victim homicides in our society. Over 8,000, nearly 8,500 um, are attributed to firearms. There are 19,000 suicides a year attributed to firearms. So. When we talk about this issue of gun violence, yes, the new towns, the Virginia Techs and the Columbines are very troublesome, but we sometimes forget about those single victim homicides that as Professor Ebels happen on a daily basis. And again, you don't have to go too far to see that happening here right in our own city. Um, in an effort to deal with this issue uh, in the city of Grand Rapids, we've had to take a, a sort of a tough stance on this issue. Now, we're, we're police officers. We're about enforcement. We're about controlling the behavior of our community. And sometimes there are certain segments of our population that don't care for that. And I understand the historical perspective of why this happens. And we have to remember that the majority of gun violence in our society, the victims and perpetrators are young black males. We forget about that oftentimes when we have third and fourth graders getting shot by crazy people with assault weapons. But the real issue in our inner city and our core cities is with black on black crime. And on a daily basis I see not necessarily people being gunned down, but victims of violence just short of death. About two months ago I was, uh, we were called to an incident uh, on the southeast side. Uh, a young man was sitting in his room playing a video game, lying down on the floor. His house was peppered with about 10 to 12 rounds. Uh, by the grace of God, he wasn't killed. He did get shot below the eye, though, just about putting his eye out, not taking out his sinus cavity, and the bullet actually came out just below his ear. Um, as horrific as that is, he lived, and much of what his life is about um, is tied to the type of violence that he was victimized by. But Simple incidents like that, and I shouldn't call them simple, but everyday incidents like that just don't make it in the papers. Um, if they do, that's maybe a, a, a small caption. And that goes in part to the overarching issue beyond gun violence in that I think life is just marginalized in our society, that we become desensitized to the violence to a great deal. Those 8,000 homicides that happen every year 8,000 more homicides from the year before and the year before that. And our glorification of violence as well. I mean, we say violence every day in our society, uh, in the movies, video games, and all the, all the sorts. And I'm not at, at all trying to 
formulate any sort of correlation or causation between video games and the violence in media, but it goes to show that we solve our problems too easily um, with violence. And in our society here in Grand Rapids, uh, unfortunately over the 18 years, uh, I see this level of violence peak uh, every four or five years. Uh, we'll, we'll have those 11 homicides, then in one month we'll have seven. And then the community gets up in arms. And then this will subside, and we'll come up with some, some solutions. They'll be implemented or not. And then we'll go on our merry way. We'll have another 11 or 12 homicides. And then in five years, we'll have another 20, and this will be an issue again. Um, and I don't mean to um, treat this problem as though it's not significant from the standpoint of everywhere in this room, but from my perspective as a law enforcement officer, um, it's unfortunate that I have become myself desensitized to some of the issues in the city. Um, and unfortunately, um, I understand violence is part of life, and I understand that we have a job, but um, I think there are far too many people out there that their lives um, are, um, are really, they're taken, they themselves take life for granted, and I think those that are involved in this level of violence take life for granted. Ma'am. Can you all hear back there? Is the, that microphone picking up? That microphone picking up? Yes, is that a yes? You okay back there? Okay, you're on. He answered for all of us. Can we just yeah. say me too? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, no, it's not allowed. Yeah. You're on. Can't we kind of switch? No, can't yeah. switch sides. All right, I'm not going to be quite as, uh, either as long or perhaps verbose. as, uh, yeah, okay, verbose, if that's what you want to call it. You know, I come to, to this discussion from a perspective of a court system as well as from an addiction and mental health viewpoint. And, and from a court system, I'm not dealing with the people who have, are right now committing it and it just happened and having to deal with preventing it. You're trying to figure out what to do with the person who did it. Or how do you work with a victim who's been through that and has experienced that and you don't want that victimization to scar them for the rest of their life. You know, when you look in terms of, of a lot of the perpetrators that we end up with in a court system, you're looking at a lot of substance use, a lot of mental health. That's been a big discussion in our office lately, has been how can you deal with that and what can you do to prevent it? And would working with those areas actually prevent it? So when you look in terms of amphetamine abuse, cocaine abuse, methamphetamine, stimulant drugs, those bring a violence with them that heroin never did. You know, I remember, and I worked in the court system in the 80s, you know, you give someone heroin, they go not out in the alley, and they really don't bother anybody other than um, perhaps to, to get their next fix. When you look in terms of the cocaine and the methamphetamine, you're looking at a lot of aggressiveness and violence that just begets violence. And if I grow up in that kind of atmosphere, I'm set up kind of to become that. Um, so. Part of what we have to look at is when you get that perpetrator or you get that victim, how do you make this not happen again? See, I took half the time, huh? <laughs> and I'll take even less. <laughs> um, just looking at it from the corrections viewpoint, um, working inside the jail and how it actually impacts um, me professionally working in the jail, you have to deal with the level of overcrowdedness, as John said, 11 homicides in a month. And when they arrest these suspects, when they um, put these subpoenas on people that don't want to talk, that actually know information, they have to come to jail. So you have to worry about protecting these people um, because a lot of it is gang violence. So you have to worry about protection, keeping them away from those that might be in the opposite gang, keeping them away from family um, that they may have caused harm to, and those different types of things. So working inside the jail and in dealing with corrections, you have to just deal with um, the aspects of these are kids. They're young, typically. Um, they've never been um, incarcerated around adults. They have to deal with rival gang members. Um, and or family members and things like that. Um, even piggybacking to the story that John gave about the kid that was shot, um, it's hard because his mother was incarcerated. So just imagine hearing that your son was shot and you're, you're incarcerated and there's nothing you can do about it. And um, 
so you deal with things like that, and it's, it's kind of hard to to maintain that balance of trying to protect and and be there for that person or help them out as best as you can when someone gets news like that, that their family has been involved in some um, traumatic event. John most certainly spoke for all of us, but, but I'd like to say I oversee a program, it's a prisoner reentry program. So every individual, male and female in our program, they have exited Michigan's prison system and they paroled back here to Grand Rapids. So the impact that this violence has on us is that everybody knows someone or they're related to someone or something along that line. So when we hear of incidents right away, we look first of all to see what the last name is to see if it's any correlation at all. And many, many times I receive calls in the middle of the night and I get up and log in and look through our system to see if this quote unquote is one of ours because it has that stigma attached to it. Uh, because most of men and women that we provide services to, they've been engaged at some level with some type of violence because it's what sent them to the prison system to begin with. So everyone that we serve, every single customer or client that we have, they've been to prison. So it's just an extension of, of what we do. And our role, basically, we help them rebuild their lives. And you'll hear a lot about um, mental health, and it's one of the reasons that Pine Rest received a contract from the Department of Corrections because our core competency is mental health. And we know through statistics that about 90, over 90% 90 of the individuals that enter the prison system to begin with or are involved in gun violence has some form of mental illness that just may have not yet been diagnosed. So I'm excited and I'm waiting to hear the next question. Well, from my perspective, and I'm a contemporary of, of John and that I've been practicing for 18 years and I've been doing criminal defense at the Defender's Office for the last 15 years, and one of the comments from my perspective as far as how this has impacted me over the duration of my career, there, there has been on my part a desensitization. I've been desensitized to the type of activity because you see it on such a daily basis. And while my colleagues were talking here, I was taking a bit of an inventory and starting February 25th through the end of June, I have seven trials scheduled. These are felony trials. Of those seven, five involve crimes of violence, whether it's third offense domestic violence, whether it's a felonious assault where someone was either threatened with a weapon or they were actually touched by that weapon, to two armed robbery cases. Uh, I just finished an armed robbery trial last week where an individual was shot in the leg. And what you see, or at least what I have seen, how has this impacted my business, for lack of a, of a better word, we're, we're relatively busy and the types of crimes that we're seeing go beyond or have gone beyond just the mere uh, assault where it's done with words or there is some threat of violence to actual shootings and stabbings. So they've taken kind of one extra step. And the unfortunate thing that I've seen is that the vast majority, you know, I don't have statistics for you, it's merely just on experience and recollection. The vast majority involve young individuals and firearms. And most of these firearms were not legally gained. Most of these firearms were sold on the street, having been <coughs> stolen at some point in time. And it's rather ironic the number of weapons that are involved in multiple offenses. In essence, they're passed around the neighborhood. So it's concerning when you see this type of activity, especially at young folks. I mean, we're talking individuals from as young as, now I don't deal with them directly unless they're waived up from juvenile court, but we've had individuals in the office as young as 14 and 15 who have been involved in serious shootings up into including homicides. Um, of these individuals that I referred to set for trial, over half of them are between 18 and 22 years of age. Uh, we'll get into some questions of why this is, and at least my opinion as to why this is, but obviously it, it is concerning 
as well it should be. And even though uh, I come from a standpoint of I am desensitized in that I focus on the elements of the crime as well as the facts surrounding it, it we can't allow ourselves to become complacent. And, and again, and I think, as John indicated, it, it is cyclical. One year, with all the, the national homicides that took place, suddenly it's an issue. But what about the 11 people that were murdered in Grand Rapids just last year? And if you look at a national level, it seems to be until it's a, quote, mass shooting, it's not a concern. But the number of people that die every day as a result of violence is staggering. I just wanted to share a story um, to let you all um, understand where I'm coming from because um, as um, Professor Ebo stated that I am a juvenile community probation officer so I work right in the line of fire every single day. Um, a few years ago, I will say about five or six years ago, um, I had young people who were being murdered on my caseload. Some of these cases are still um, cold cases, um, open under investigation. Um, others, the perpetrators have um, been um, held accountable. But I went to funerals at least four or five times out a month because of the individuals who were on my caseload, the families that I work with uh, were, were murdered. Um, one particular unique case was um, one of my young men had just graduated from an alternative school in Wyoming, had plans of attending Grimes Community College. Um, I made it my business to make sure that he was to attend, um, helped him with um, his cap and gown, provided monies for that because his family did not have the necessary funds. Um, also, um, we had a <clears throat> school date where we came to um, the Grounds Community College and I showed him around a little bit, explained to him how he would um, get his um, student ID number, all the information that he would need to begin taking classes. Within a few months after graduation, he was killed or murdered in front of my community office um, late October or November. Um, that was devastating to me. So as far as desensitizing um, and the line of work that I do, it's difficult for me um, as an individual to be des desensitized to what's going on around me because I live in it, I work in it every single day. Um, I am part of these individuals and families' lives, not just at work, but also when I'm out in the community, in the churches, the neighborhoods. Um, I attend this, I go to the same stores, movies, uh, wherever, I'm there. Um, so the passion um, is not, is, is, is very deep. I've been working in the field for almost 17 years. Um, and I think the day that I become desensitized or complacent, that I think it's time for me to leave. Um, but to get back to that story, the young man or the alleged um, shooter um, was on my caseload at the time. So that was very difficult for me. Here I have a young man who was murdered and then I also have the alleged perpetrator that is on my caseload. So how do you deal with that? So when we talk about how it affects um, me professionally, it also affects me personally, mentally and emotionally. So I sat at the funeral thinking about this particular person who um, they have named as a suspect for my young man's uh, murder. Um, just to speed it up, uh, this year, I would say in the last couple of years, I haven't had a lot of my young men um, murdered. However, I've had a lot of them enter into our correctional system, which they are now doing between four years minimum to 25 years or life. And so I've seen a lot of my young um, individuals who are four, 14, 15, many of them have been way to the adult system and are now looking at time in prison. Um, the youngest one that I've had um, just recently, he was just sentenced yesterday as a matter of fact, um, was shot in the face at 14 um, and then um, within two months went out and um, 
um, received an armed robbery or um, pull someone, uh, I'm sorry, put a gun out on someone and um, didn't shoot them, but robbed them. Um, shortly after that, he was placed on probation, on juvenile probation, had difficulties with him um, in the community, removed him from the community for about 10 or 11 months, returned back to Grand Rapids, the Grand Rapids area last year um, in October. Within six days, he was able to obtain a gun and rob someone else. It was on the news. Um, he eventually pled guilty to armed robbery. Um, he was waived as an adult. He was 15 at the time last year. Um, he was 15, was waived as an adult, and um, was awaiting you know, sentencing, which I believe he was sentenced yesterday to at least 8 to 15 years in prison. He's 16 years old. So how does it really affect me um, professionally? As I said, I work out in the community every single day. My main contact area is Martin Luther King area. We're assigned to a certain size of Grand Rapids. And so um, part of my, or my expectations as a probation officer is to meet with these um, young people and their families in their homes. And so um, safety is a major concern, not only for me, but also for the families that I'm working with. Um, I do not carry a gun, I do not carry pepper spray, nor do I carry a bulletproof vest. I don't have anything but myself. I always tell the students I have my left hand because I'm left-handed, so if someone attempts to hurt me, the only thing I can do is throw that left hook and follow it up by right. So that's all I have. But really, um, what I have is the relationship that I have with these young people. That's all that I have is the relationship, and I think that's what is very important. That's how I am very successful in the work that I do. And what I think that needs to happen is that we need to start rebuilding those relationships all over again. Um, I don't have access to um, a lot of the community centers. I mean, the community center that I work at, um, it is a area where um, gang violence is very prevalent. Um, Martin Luther King areas where um, a particular gang called Bemis is where that's their hangout, that's their territory. Um, and so families are afraid to come to my office because they may have some type of conflict with a different, um, with, with a particular uh, gang. And so again, all I have is my relationship that, um, and my skills, my social skills um, that I have acquired um, to use to protect myself and protect them. In my nine years of working out in the community, I have not had not one gang member or gang fight at my community office. And I think that says a lot. I'm not here to boast. I'm a very humble person. But again, I think that a lot of it has to do with us building those relationships that have been broken down from not only just from parents, um, law enforcement, but even our community, um, lack of education, all the above. So um, those are some of my concerns. Um, it has been addressed since the recent shootings um, and violence in Grand Rapids. Um, our supervisors have um, discussed with us about making sure that we practice um, safety um, measures. If it, is, if it involves taking a, another coworker with us or a surveillance officer, or even um, contacting our community officer. I am assigned to a community officer. The only thing with that is that um, the community officer that I'm assigned to does not always, is, is accessible, accessible um, because my home visits and my office visits are conducted during the evenings. And he is not working during the evenings. I do have access to call you know, the police. However, sometimes it makes it difficult if they're out patrolling other area, areas to have them come out and sit and with me and monitor to make sure that I'm safe. So there are a lot of safety issues that are involved in the line of work that I do, but I'm confident that if we continue to have meetings like this and we begin to work together, that we will be able to curve um, this violence. Thank you. Thanks, Linnell. I always said that uh, we live in one of the smallest big cities in Michigan. And the reason I say that is that there's almost never an event that goes on that's newsworthy, that's local, 
that I don't go into one of my classes and during the next week or the next time we meet that someone in the class says, did you hear about that? And we go, yes. And they go, well, that was a relative. That was next door. That was at my house. I knew that person. I had a student in my class about a year ago who was actually a victim. He got shot in the head. He was there one day. The next day he wasn't there, and I got a call. He was, um, he was in intensive care at the hospital. He got shot in the head. He survived. Nobody expected him to do that. But this all hits close to home. And so what we want to do is that we found out the professional, but now the same question is, what about the stakeholders? And, and if you don't know what that buzzword is, that big word is, you're the stakeholders. You live here. You go to school here in West Michigan. Um, you know people. Um, and so we're looking for a few of you to, to tell us how you think that this type of thing has impacted you, either directly or indirectly. And if you have something to contribute, we're looking for several of you to do that. Just raise your hand. We'll come over and see you so everybody can hear. Anyone? There's uh, a hand in the back. As, we're, as you all are answering the question, we would ask that you stand and state your name. My name is Ray Erickson. I'm a, obviously a, a recruit for the GRCC Police Academy. Um, thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for sitting on the panel. I appreciate it. I think I can speak for everybody that way. Um, my personal experience with uh, violence in the community, I live in Kentwood and literally two blocks away from where uh, there was a family whose house was broken into, car was stolen, they were shot, the car was found burning and burned someplace else. Um, now that I'm here at night, four days a week, my wife doesn't sleep well. Uh, so that impacts me because here I am trying to learn to protect the rest of us and I can't even protect my own wife because she's afraid the house is gonna get broken into and now I'm looking at buying a new dog. Thank you. Anybody else? Good evening. My name is Felix Torres. I'm an academy student as well. Uh, I think uh, violence in the community has impacted mostly everyone in here, even if you live in a community, uh, makes it fearful to walk outside. I, do, I would like to uh, mention that the officer had a good point. Um, the, despite people wanting to say the fact that the media is not really involved, I think it is. They accentuate or centralize a lot of that um, violence on the streets, which makes a lot of our youth think that it's okay to do stuff like that, to just make it so prevalent, so obvious every day of violence, video games and stuff like that. That's neither here nor there, but I think the media itself um, gives people a lot to talk about, and I think that that trickles right down to our kids. Um, the community is impacted the most because they fear going into Grand Rapids, or some people don't want to go to work, or some people are just afraid. Um, so it's just, it's, to me, I think that's impacted me and impacted a lot of people. Um, so hopefully, if this stuff keeps happening, we get together as people, can talk to our kids, talk to our youths, impact them in certain ways, maybe be more involved. I think that'll help a little bit. Hello. Close like this? OK. My name is Julie Curtis. Um, first and foremost, I am a community member now here in Grand Rapids. I've lived here for a year. Um, Yes, I love it. Um, I am also a senior at Ferris State University uh, criminal justice program. And I guess how it's affected me personally is when I moved to this city, I moved from the east side of the state, from the Detroit area. And I thought coming here was going to be fantastic because you know what? Grand Rapids has a beautiful reputation and it, it is a beautiful city. Um, I live in the Creston area. I love that community. Um, I was out walking my dog the night that the, shot, the, the young man was killed on Sweet Street. I was one block from that, that shooting. My partner doesn't want me to walk the dog anymore. And like you, sir, that you know, you're going to school for criminal justice, to, you're an officer, and your wife is scared. You know, we're learning what to do to help prevent this, but at the same time, we're helpless. And it's a feeling in a community that we want to do more, we want to be involved. We're all here in our community setting, 
But what is it that we can do as students, I guess, is what, what my question is to the panel. If I can ask a question, is that okay? <laughs> Hi. Um, I, uh, my son and I witnessed a young boy that got shot over on Eastern, and the thing that startled me most was the fact that everybody was driving by. Nobody stopped. There was four kids bent over this boy, and the boy, the kids were calling the police, and I, I noticed that, and I was like, well, everybody's passing by. No adults stopped to help these children save this boy. And we, we pulled up, my son and I pulled up there, and then we noticed that the police were coming, but it startled me that these kids were in this much trouble and they were trying to help each other and no adults come. The ones that come out of the gas station, the adults that come out of the gas station, were smiling. Why were they smiling? A boy had just gotten shot and they were smiling. It's crazy. We need to be more concerned about our children. Hello, everybody. My name is Brian Blakely. I'm a, a local pastor, and I am also a director of a, a community-based nonprofit. And I see uh, these things on a daily basis. I live right in the heart of the city. I'm, I'm on Bates Street, uh, close to Franklin Eastern. And I see the impact of the violence. Um, people are fearful. People don't know what to do. People are feeling uh, hopeless. People, uh, there is a lack of uh, resources, lack of education, lack of finances, and it creates hopelessness. And what I'm, what I'm seeing on a daily basis is that people have to, um, instead of being fearful, they have to come together. They have to bond together because it's a lot of good people in Grand Rapids, and uh, we have a, just a few occasions where we have people who do some bad things and it gives everybody else a bad name and they get fearful and they feel like if they stick their head up that they're gonna be targeted. But uh, one of the things that uh, has impacted uh, me and my organization with the violence is rounding people up and bringing people together so that we can combat these senseless acts of violence as a, uh, a joint force together. And if we do that together, a lot of these things won't happen. If we take ownership in our communities, a lot of these things will not be able to happen. Morning, uh, my good morning, uh, good evening. My name is Chris Warfel. I'm going here uh, in the, the corrections program. And uh, the way all this violence has impacted me, <clears throat> like I grew up in Kentwood and I never really I'd like walk to a friend's house a couple miles, never really had anything to worry about. But uh, recently I moved off of Kalamazoo Avenue down uh, by Boston Square. And uh, no, I've uh, caught kids trying to break into the house next to me. And uh, like, heck, the day I moved in, I heard a bunch of gunshots fired re uh, within distance and I even closed down that street. It was uh, Elliott Street uh, right off of uh, Burton. And as a result, like, I am still feel kind of safe once in a while, but overall, like, I'm kind of actually paranoid for uh, my safety and my girlfriend's safety because I work third shift. And so that leaves her there all alone. And bless her heart, she really doesn't know how to use a weapon all too well. And I usually keep a rifle next to my bed as a result. Like, I dealt with a lot of uncertainty and stress uh, when I was over in the Middle East, but never thought I would feel a lot of those same emotions living here where I grew up at. And it shouldn't be like that for anyone. You should be able to take a walk down the street, go walk your dog, um, sit outside and drink a glass of lemonade or a beer or something, not have to worry about anyone coming trying to break into your house or start anything with you. And... It's completely asinine how things are progressively getting worse over time. Anybody else? What about up here? You can impress your instructor right now. There you go. Extra credit. Hi, my name's Renee, and I am in the criminal justice 
uh, field, hopefully, in what Ms. Talbert's um, profession is, uh, juvenile uh, probation. Um, I lived in the northwest side of Grand Rapids for 10 years. And I worked as a, how you put it, it was a north, like a neighborhood watch captain for six of that 10. And I thought things were gonna get better. They didn't, they got worse. And as friendly as I am <laughs> and my kids, I have three young children. And there comes a time when you have so much violence going on in your, just within your vicinity of your house, just within one block. You, you kind of, I guess, take a step back and look at what's more important. Because of the violence that we had in our neighborhood, there's drugs on the side of our house going on, drugs dealing. Uh, I don't know, it was just a lot of things that shouldn't have occurred. And because of that, I moved. There comes a point when your family is more important than, you know, I lost my house because of this violence and we gave up. So yeah, it's impacted me a lot. And unfortunately that's, I probably will never move back to Grand Rapids, unfortunately, but I'm willing to help with trying to solve this violence problem because no matter where you're at, there's violence all over. And I think that, that really impacts a lot of people. They're afraid. Um. Hi, everybody. My name is Sequoia Hudnell. I currently work in the field um, with juveniles. And I'm sorry, I don't want to offend anybody, but I just feel like right now, the violence with juveniles and everything that's going on right now, this is absolutely ridiculous. And I feel like us as criminal justice majors and being in our field, we need to take action. Um, everybody needs to get out of that, oh, I'm afraid and I'm moving and oh, I gotta get away. Cause like you said, violence is everywhere. It's not gonna go anywhere unless we do something about it. So us being in this field, some, we need to take action and not be running around and being afraid and saying, oh, well, I'm going to go over here and move to Kentucky because they don't shoot everybody up down there or, you know, we need to do something. So that's it. My name is Mario and uh, I was born in El Salvador during the Civil War. And so violence has, you know, been part of my life since childbirth. And uh, I've been, I grew up in East LA too, so I know the, directly the, the, the consequences of violence. I've seen many of my friends that are no longer here because of it. Um, and so when I moved to Grand Rapids in 96, I started seeing the same trends, kind of, uh, you know, the, the same things that I started seeing in LA, you know, started also being here in Grand Rapids. So I, I started mentoring and just did everything that I could to get involved, just like what she's saying, you know, we, we need to get involved because if we let the violence dictate our lives, because I could have chosen to continue the path of violence myself, but I'd rather be the one getting, like what she's talking about, having, building that relationship with these young people, being able to connect with her through the churches, through the schools. And we have here a, a, a group of people says these meetings are important because, you know, the more you know, the better you are. How are you going to reach? And we have a, the, the violence is just the pinnacle of what's a deeper issue. And until we get to connect with the young people, it's going to start making a difference. So connect with young people. Thank you. Hi, my name is Nicole. Um, there's a few things. I... I'm a stay-at-home mom, um, and I have been for 10 years. In my former life, I was worked in public health and injury prevention. Um, but what's going on in our nation and in Grand Rapids um, affected me because it, I don't know who said I don't want to become complacent, but I think there's many of us who have just said, well, this is what happens. We watch the news, we grieve, we pray, and then we move on, and that's terrible. We, I think a lot of people have become complacent. And what happened nationally 
Sandy Hook, obviously it's a very small fraction of the violence, the gun violence that happens in our country, but I think it was really a galvanizing moment in our country. I think it really got a lot of people who used to say, or maybe would it's easier to say, that's not my problem, that's not me, it's not gonna happen. It happens, and then once you have that moment of awareness, um, I think you really learn every day. I mean, there's been thousands of people who have died since Sandy Hook, which was eight weeks ago. So um, I looked into it and I thought, well, how do I, how do I get involved? What, it, what can I offer to this discussion and what can I do to help? So I looked into it and I became involved with an organization. It's a grassroots organization that's kind of modeled after Mothers Against Drunk, Drunk Driving that's called One Million Moms for Gun Control that just really addresses the sheer volume of guns that are out there and the ease with which they're able to be obtained. There's, you know, obviously the national debate is around background checks and there's all kinds of other issues, but gun violence is a complex issue, but I think it's important that every single one of us speak up and finally say, we've all collectively had enough and what can I do to help? Whatever your mental health, criminal justice, whatever your area of expertise or however you can become involved, I think it's so important that we finally all do. Uh, yes, hello, my name is Lamar L. Stevens and I'm a corrections uh, student. Um, before I get started, I'd like to say, in my opinion, gun don't, guns don't kill people. Bad people with guns kill people. You need more education about use of them. Um, when I grew up, I walked a couple miles as a five and six year old to school. As a parent now, I take all my kids to school. It's not that I don't feel safe, but it's more proactive as far as my kids. I think it's more in the community we need men to talk to men. We have single parents, moms that if they work, have two and three jobs and kids are raising kids. And until kids get into the system, they don't realize how serious being behind these bars are. We just need some like, a lot of kids don't have no one they can really turn to and say they respect, they fear, they give a care how they feel about them. We have no one, everybody's too busy in their own lives to, to teach one, reach one. We just need to stop for a second and grab one, just one. If you can get one and turn them in that direction, then that's one you don't have to worry about where they're going. That's one you don't have to worry about if they're going to stick you up. We're just too busy. We need to take time and focus on the people around us. Anyone else? Okay. Take another chance. Uh, Pam, did you have any reactions that you want to capture before we move on, or should we just move on? Anyone? I, I think um, uh, many of you said that we. We have become all too tolerant of this behavior in our society, um, that we expect it to happen. And as the young man stated in the back, I think if we break this problem down to its very smallest part, and that is just mentoring one young person um, for one half hour a week, if you want to break it down that small, um, think of the impact that we could have in our society. If all of us collectively just spent time with one young person that is at risk and affected that person's life in a meaningful manner, we would have a significant impact. And you can do it right here in the city of Grand Rapids. Uh, there are programs that are available in which anybody in this room could read to a third or fourth grader, could mentor a sixth or seventh grader, could play sports with a high school student. That level of impact uh, is amazing in the lives of these young people who, as this young man stated in the back, um, many of them come from homes in which uh, they don't have a lot. Their prospects are, are minimal at best. And they just need somebody that they can look up to, that they can respect and have respect thrown back at them. And, uh, you know, to use the term, it takes a village to raise a child, it really does, no matter where you come from. Um, there is struggle all over our, our country, and, and struggle knows no cultural or racial or ethnic bounds. Struggle is everywhere. Unfortunately, we see a little bit too much of it here in the core city. Um, 
and there's a lot of great people that, is, that are doing a lot of great work. But unfortunately, in certain segments of our society, we've just tolerated this behavior. You think this shit had happened in East Grand Rapids? Absolutely not. In Caledonia? Hell no. Why should, it, why should any parent here in the inner city Grand Rapids tolerate this behavior? Do they love their children any less? Absolutely not. We may need a little more help here. Absolutely. Um, but that starts with the empowering of people to get a better life, to move forward, to get out of the situation they're in. That snowballing effect, I think, would, would help considerably. I'd just like to encourage you all that you don't have to be a professional or in the field to be able to um, make an impact in another person's life, whether young or old. Um, so you don't have to carry around a title. You can just be an ordinary human being who loves to work with people who have the passion. It comes from the heart. It doesn't, you, you won't learn um, how to build relationship, relationships with others um, by going to school or because of the status or the title or the position that you carry. It comes from the heart. So if any of you, and if not all of us, have the desire to make a change, then we have to be able to step out and courage. We have to be able to step out and not be afraid to be able to, um, as I shared with the students before we came down here, just to say hi. I find it difficult that when I'm walking down the street or walking to, into the courthouse, I see people that I may come in contact with three or four times out the week who don't even speak to me. Um, or if I say hi, they may just smile. Again, building relationships is important. It starts from the smallest, and then we work ourselves up. You don't have to be in law enforcement. You don't have to be a criminal justice major. You can be a stay-at-home mom. You can be a, uh, maybe a basketball coach or a single mom or a single dad or um, even come from a two-parent family. We speak on how there's a lack of resources in our inner city. However, we have a lot of resources in our inner city that are made available, that are available, but our families are not aware of the resources that are out there. So for those of us who have programs that are within our communities, you need to, we need to be able to share that information with others. And we don't know it unless um, we won't know about it and we can't um, utilize those programs if we're not aware of it. And so just making ourselves aware as to what is going on. And again, you don't have to be a part of a program to see a young person walking down the street and say hi, or to see a struggling mother who may need a ride. She has her baby in her hands and um, it's cold outside just to ask if she need a ride down the street. We have to begin to step outside of our comfort zone to make a difference. Okay, next question. Uh, some of you have already covered this, um, and it pretty much got beat to death the last two nights if you were here. How many people were here last night? How many people? Yeah, you're stuck, huh? How many people <laughs> the night before, the first night, Monday night? Okay, so how many people have been here all three nights? You get an extra cookie. Go ahead and help yourself there, okay? <laughs> Anyways, we're going to give you the true story as to what we think is causing this, as opposed to the people who read books all the time from the other two nights. So. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to open up this question. We're not going to necessarily go down. It's, it's a tough, us criminal justice are tough. Um, well, you know, he, just, he just said that to his um, boss, the provost of our college. <laughs> Dr. Healy, can you raise your hand? <laughs> Hi, boss. <laughs> Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> um, oh, I'm all, <laughs> no clue what I'm doing now. <laughs> Anyways, I'm going to... That's right. <laughs> Nikki, we need to talk. Um, anyways, uh, anybody want to take this on first? Uh, like I said, some of you already touched on this, on this part. Um, reiterate this. What are your thoughts based upon your experiences out there? What's the question again? The question is, in your opinion, what are some of the causational oh. factors triggering violence? I actually think it's one of the most challenging questions today on the face of the earth. Um, it, it, it's no one, two, or, or, or ten reasons. Uh, I think it can be a combination of, of many or one or a half of one based on the individual. Um, 
But a couple of uh, overarching facts, I think, the, the, the vast availability of firearms, first of all. Um, we have over 310 million firearms in the United States today. Gold comes down to about 40 percent of every household at least has one. And then it goes a little bit further. If you have one, you generally have several. And so just the availability of firearms, but when you have 310 million, you can take 20 million away, and what will that do? You know, so it's just that, the ability to get a gun. And then many folks haven't figured out yet how to, um, you, you know, live a life when they don't have, they don't understand the resources. We're, Kent County and Grand Rapids, we are very, very rich in resources. It's, it's very, very few folks that if they really understood the level of resources available to them in their situation, that they'd have to go without them and their family. But for whatever reason, some folks feel when they don't have something that it's just not a big problem to go out and try to take it from someone else. Um, you, you know, it's this slippery slope about, you know, turning on the TV and, you know, looking at videos and, and, and certain video games and things of that nature. But at some point as individuals, that would have to impact us at some level. Um, you know, I played a video game, I, I hunt and fish. And I have a nine-year-old grandson, and we have these hunting video games. And, you know, it's with the Wii, so you get to push the button, and it pulls the bow back. And, you know, uh, I've never shot a deer with a bow other than in this game. But I, I, let me tell you, I, I, get to, I start sweating and shaking and when I miss. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that, the impact of that on a 9, 10, and 11-year-old who does that every single day. I, I would have to think as a professional that somewhere along that line is, is life cheapened, you know, the availability to shoot someone. I think that stigma, um, it's diminished. And a couple of folks up here mentioned the word, dis, dis, you know, uh, desensitized, and that's a scary word. Um, I'm not so sure that I'm desensitized. I work with folks. Each and every day, every individual's been to prison. And, you know, the flip side of that, and this may come as a surprise to some of my students here, we would get to this this semester, but I'm an ex-offender myself. I served over 14 years in Michigan prison in one setting. And so, you know, uh, you can have that title, you can earn that title, but I've not always had it. I came from the other side of the fence. But I've given opportunities here in Grand Rapids to every opportunity was afforded me to change my life. And now I, I'm the director of a prison reentry program. I, I have a, a clearance. I can go in any prison in the state of Michigan, but who the hell would want to do that? <laughs> you know? But listen, I love doing that because I have the opportunity to impact them and help them change their lives. So I'll be there tomorrow morning. I can't wait. But, you, you know, so I don't think we, we, we can come desensitized, but, you know, we will still shed a tear. We will still become frustrated because even in our work, I can't help everybody. You know, for one, I don't have the, the resources and the dollars to help everybody. And, and sad as it may seem, everybody doesn't want help. So we kind of look out in our caseload and those that we, we offer it to everyone. We don't wait till they're here. We go into the prison and meet them nine months before they're released. So, you know, those that look for help or they, they'd like to help, the ability to change, we're there to help them rebuild their lives. And despite our best efforts, some folks, it might take them three or four or five times, but we don't throw the individual away. We doesn't count the times that they fall and get back up. We just constantly encourage them to, to, to get back up, and we're there to help them. We don't look down our nose and point our fingers at them and treat them any other way, because had someone done that to me, I doubt if I'd be sitting at this table today. So. Anyone else, causational factors? I'll speak to a little bit. Uh, and again, I think the complexities of this issue go beyond the discussion that we can have in, in just a few hours. Uh, 
we can we could spend this time talking about education. We could spend the time talking about social economic. We could talk about uh, parental upbringing, etc. From my perspective, what what I can bring, and it's just talking to people. Now, I should probably clarify because it's it, I, I did use the term desensitized. What I mean by that is, in in doing what I've done, representing people for over. Eight, close to 18 years now, it's unfortunate, and I speak to myself of this, very little now shocks the conscience. Does it mean I don't care or I'm not concerned? Absolutely not. And, and it's one where I'm in a business where my wife and family can attest, I keep my business at the office. Why do I do that? Because I, I'd be very depressed if I took it home and I talk about it there. I, we keep it at the office. That's just me personally. But I had an opportunity to represent a young man a few years, well, actually a few months back, and he's one of many that I've represented, where you have an individual who, 17, 18 years old, in school, carrying a good grade point average, athletic, limited record if to, to no record, and a vehicle gets pulled over, and lo and behold, he has a gun on him. And he's charged with something called carrying a concealed weapon. In the state of Michigan, that's a felony. And one of the ways that the prosecutor's office deals with that type of charges, more often than not, plea offers are not made. That's the charge. That's what sticks. Now, that's not an absolute, but generally that's what happens. And I asked this young man, part of our discussion, why? Why do you, you know, my first question, do you have any training with a weapon? Absolutely not. Where did you get it? Well, on the street. No, no. Where did you get it? Well, I got it from so-and-so. Why did you have it? Well, for my protection. Protection from what? What do you mean protection? Uh, you know, are you a fugitive? What, what's the issue? Are you running from someone? Did you forget to pay a bill? Well, no, it's, it's the people that I'm, I'm with. Well, what do you mean the people you're with? Well, everyone else has a gun, so I guess I needed one. Why? What do you need? You know, what do you plan on doing with this gun was my next question. Well, I don't know. Have you ever fired this gun? No, I've never fired a gun. Do you even know how to hold it, handle it? No. Why do you, so the only thing you know how to do is stick it in your waistband. What good is this going to come? What, what do you plan on doing? If someone confronts you with it, what are you going to do? You just told me you didn't know how to use it. Well, I don't know. Generally, when a gun is pulled on someone, one of two things happens. Either you shoot them or they shoot you. You're 18 years old. Either you're going to end somebody's life or someone's life or your life is going to end. Is that what you want? Well, no. And then you see them look down at the floor and you know, tears start to well up. Stop crying. You're a big boy now. You want to play with guns? We're going to talk about the responsibilities. These are some of the conversations that I, I have with my clients. And this was a young man. We got him through the situation. We, uh, speaking being a bit arrogant here, but we ended up getting a resolution to this case. We ended up getting him on a program where he was able to have this charge taken off of his record. And he's in college now, doing quite well. I talk to his mother every now and again. And it, but, but he's just one person. One person out of hundreds a year that I represent. The ones that truly concern me, I had another young man, same scenario, caught with a gun. And in this case, it was one of, eh, if I go to prison, I go to prison. Now, I've only visited folks in prison, clients that I've had to represent. That's not a place I care to go back to. Number one, there's too many rules. I'm not exactly a rule follower. I am, but I'm not. But, you know, I'll follow the rules, but you know, people do this, do this. You get up at this particular time, you go to bed at this time, you go have dinner at this time, and well, I don't want to have dinner at that time. Well, that's too bad. This is when we're having dinner. The concern that I have with many young folks that I deal with, they're not afraid. They're not afraid. Now, whether it's a front that they're trying to put on that they're scared to death, and the vast majority of them are, but they have to somehow put this front on. Well, I'm not afraid to go to prison. Well, you should be. Those are the concerns that I have and that I see in that I've found just a conversation and being a good listener. And, and yes, time is precious. But I can say to you, if you know someone, a youth, 
they don't have to be a youth, anyone who struggles with this. And most of these are gang related. The peer pressure, there's a gentleman in the back who I'd, I'd love to have a conversation who was from LA. I'm not speaking for you, but my guess is the, the, the amount of peer pressure to become involved in this type of activity is overwhelming. It's overwhelming. And at times it can be dangerous. If you don't join or participate, bad things will happen. But from a community standpoint, what I can emphasize to anyone, to everyone out here, just listening sometimes, listening to the concerns. I have two boys at home. My greatest fear in having children was not the expense, because God knows they're expensive, but it's dealing with the issues that are out there now. The issues of getting into a little fight on the playground, talking to them about drugs obviously is important, but it's the peer pressure and the issues that children have to deal with. Children, and that's, that's correct, children have to deal with. It's sad, but the start is we can't be victims. Have to at least step up and just listen to some of these kids and the concerns. And if you can just point them in the right direction, the resources are there. And if they're not, they're easy to come by. But just listen. Okay. I just want to say, um, as far as my opinion and thinking, um, what are some of the causational factors um, that's triggering, triggering so much violence in our community? I think it's a couple different reasons. Um, mainly, the first one I would say is ignorance. Um, you have a lot of people out there that just don't know, and they're trying to fit in, they're lost, um, so they reach out and they branch out to whoever's showing them um, love or attention or anything like that. So I think the, the biggest problem would be ignorance. And they don't think about the consequences. They go out and they, they do something, they think that they're gonna go out and rob someone and get some money and they end up killing that person. They don't think about that they're gonna spend the rest of their life in prison or that someone may come after them and in return kill them or kill their, their aunt or kill their girlfriend or, or things like that. So I think a huge problem is, is ignorance. They don't know how to problem solve. Um, work out their disputes or their fights or anything like that. All they know how to do is to get a gun from one of their peers or break into someone's house and, and steal a gun there and go out and, and react to a situation that could have been handled completely different besides going to, to kill that person. Um, and then again, from what, ev what everyone has been saying tonight, is just the lack of role models um, and that positive influence. Um, it's so hard to find someone to just tell a person that they care. Um, when you look at the school systems today and things like that, I think that that's a huge impact. And when you don't have a positive role model, I know when I was growing up in school, I had positive role models everywhere. All of my instructors, all of my teachers, all of my instructors in my church and things like that. Um, and that's missing today. You don't have people that are out there telling um, little boys how, how to carry themselves, to pull up their pants, to, um, to do things that, that they should know. So a huge problem is the lack of role models out in the community um, and with people trying to fit in. You see, I see it in the jail all the time. One person walking around sagging, the other one does. One person that gets in a fight, the other one has to jump in just to try to fit in. So actually teaching this person how to be an individual, how to stand up for themselves and things like that, that's, that's what's missing. And I think that's a huge problem that causes um, a lot of the violence that we have um, in our community. Okay, I guess I have to say something. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I'm going I'm to throw out a couple of other kinds of things, like the lack of community. I mean, how many of you went to school in your own community? How many of you live in the community you were raised in? How many of you know your neighbors? How many of you know the people who live next door to you? How many of you know the people that live five doors away from you? You know, when did we get away from getting to know the people that we lived around or living in transient communities or looking out for someone else? You know, when I was growing up, I'll age myself, you know, there was neighborhood watch programs and everybody knew everybody on your street and you watched out for all the kids who walked home. You knew who belonged there and who didn't belong there. 
and you weren't going to hesitate in terms of becoming involved. We don't do those kinds of things now. I have a daughter that lives in the Creston neighborhood and, and two blocks away from the, the last shooting. And, and she's talked about, should I have a weapon? Should I have a gun? Well, her solution is multiple pit bulls. And I'm not suggesting that perhaps they're any better than, than owning a handgun, but that is her solution. And as most people in her neighborhood tell me, we're not going anywhere near that house. <laughs> um, you know, when you start talking about desensitization in terms of your neighborhoods and getting to know things, and, and everybody who's sitting in here kind of said you were interested in criminal justice. You know, if you're interested in criminal justice, you've already taken an edge. You know, you know that you're going to run towards something instead of away from something. You know the person sitting across the table from you isn't going to be a, a, a perfect person or who's never been in trouble. You're going to deal with violent people. You're going to deal with drug abusers. And, and just the fact that you have the courage now to go into that kind of profession says a lot about you. I listened to somebody mention in terms of million mothers or a mad. You know, think about, again, you probably can't because most of you are too young, but when you think about back to drunk driving, before MAD, drunk driving was I drive you home, especially if you're female, the cop drove you home instead of arresting you and putting you in custody for driving drunk. You know, MAD had a big impact on how we enforce the laws in terms of drunk driving. Domestic violence laws, if you go back again a few years, you know, it was very difficult to have a prosecution in terms of domestic violence, and yet now, um, we were talking before this program that every person that has a domestic violence on their record coming out of prison into the reentry program has to do 52 weeks of a counseling session. You would never have heard of that a few years ago. You can make a difference, whether it's mentoring someone, whether it's a grassroots effort, you know, whether it's just getting to know your next door neighbor. You know, I, my background in terms of teaching here is substance abuse. You know, I see a lot of of people come out of substance abuse families, alcoholic families. Um, when you start talking about someone who's raised with a, a mother who spends most of her savings and her life smoking crack, oh, you don't learn how to care about somebody else, how to bond with somebody else, or how to be a parent yourself. You know, sometimes it's just those kinds of things, learning or teaching somebody how to be a better parent to their own kids or helping out that kid whose parent isn't in a position to be able to help them. Um, but again, I applaud all of you for even being interested in the profession because it's going to take a lot. It's going to take a toll on you and on your families. And, but yet you'll probably never find a greater reward. At least I never had. Go ahead, John. We've got time. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to echo what um, Nikki Edwards said with respect to conflict <coughs> resolution. Um, I have seen through my experience um, just the inability to uh, resolve conflict in a meaningful manner in our society. When I first started, many of the homicides were attributed to crack cocaine and, and crack cocaine markets. I can kind of wrap my head around that um, from an economic standpoint. If you're moving into my turf, that's problematic because that... Uh, that results in my bottom line being impacted. And I'm, I'm by no means attempting to justify homicides in the late 80s and early 90s, but you at least understood on some level what was going on. Now in this day and age, I have no idea whatsoever why kids are killing kids. I, I don't think they know either. Because this stuff, it just is self-perpetuating. It's a snowballing effect. You know, I'm shooting him because he shot at my buddy who shot at his buddy, and it goes on down the line. By the time you reach the 10th person, they have no idea why they're shooting at this other person. Um, is it over uh, somebody disrespecting somebody? Is it the color of somebody's gym shoes? One of our shootings was because one young man threw a snowball at another young man's girlfriend. I'm not kidding you. They started shooting at each other over that. So the inability to, to resolve conflict in a manner in which a civilized society should expect has really become marginalized. We need to teach um, our young people how to resolve conflict in a manner in which that won't get them killed. Uh, we need to teach our children that if you have a problem with somebody, you discuss it, you talk about it, you resolve it in a manner in which violence um, is not involved. And I think 
in our fast-paced, technologically advanced society, somehow interpersonal communication is lost on many levels. It's much more convenient to solve problems in that manner and a more expeditious manner, whether it's texting somebody or whether it's shooting at somebody. I would just like to also um, to say that um, in my experience in working with the families is that um, what I see as some of the causational factors is um, some um, of what um, others have already stated, but the lack of education, um, not just to the point of resources, but even in our schools um, in regards to um, the separation of how inner city schools um, receive their education compared to um, the, the outer schools within our communities. And so um, that to me is a causational factor because it presents a disruption um, in, in the school setting. Um, also, um, the lack of, I'm sorry, the lack of parenting. Um, although I work with juveniles, we also work closely with the parents or the guardians of these juveniles. And so um, some of their, their parental, um, there's some parental issues. And as a probation officer, sometimes I have to wear the hat of the parent and also to be able to educate the parent on how to parent their child. And so um, the inability for um, these parents to parent their, their children, I believe is a causational factor along with the substance use. Um, this number may, I may be off um, a little bit, but majority of our um, young people that we work with, most of them use marijuana, if not other drugs. Um, but the most common drug is marijuana. And so um, their inability to think rationally, um, as um, the officer just mentioned, um, and to deal with conflict is one of um, a, a huge factor um, in regards to violence. Um, peer pressure, and, and I have to say that in my, in my line of work again, the fact that these young people want to um, be a part of something or someone makes it more frightening and concerning for myself and I'm sure for the other um, workers, officers, and law enforcement. Um, those are the most scariest folks you know, in our community, those who are trying to obtain some type of status. Not the ones who are very um, street minded, but the ones who are trying to get in where they can fit in. Those are the ones that are hurting others. And so um, a lack of inspiration, a lack of goals, a lack of self identity is also, in my opinion, a causational factor. Oftentimes I ask the young people, what are some of your goals? 15, 16, 14, 15 years old. What are some of your goals? What do you want to do? Um, when you get older. A lot of them, they have no clue as to what they want to do when they get older. They're just trying to survive one day at a time. If they make it home alive, you know, that's, that's about as far as they, they think in regards to their life. So um, empowering them to, um, or encouraging them to understand that it's okay for them to live where they live, to be who they are, to go to attend the school that they attend, um, also um, to um, help them understand that they are okay, who, however they were made, however God has made them, they are who they are and that's okay. And for them to accept themselves, um, I think that's something that we need to work on on an everyday, um, on an everyday basis. Um, I had a young man in my office today, it was just so disheartening. Um, a young man, almost 17 years of age, and um, he was um, referred to our uh, system because of a home invasion. He didn't even know the kid. He actually went into the home with another kid, not knowing who this kid is, just went just because this kid had mentioned that he had been breaking into some homes um, in the area. And the kid asked him if he wanted to go along. Now, now he's on probation, has, does not have a um, juvenile record except for this home invasion charge, but he wants to fit in. He's um, overweight, he has some mental health issues, which is another causational factor, and I'm sure that may be touched on um, later this evening, but mental health issues. Um, he also, um, he doesn't have very many friends. 
Um, they call him names. And so there's a lot of other underlying issues just, you know, besides, um, we had a conversation last week about um, a young, or a person that went into the party store, help me out if I say the story, if I speak on it wrong, but went into the party store or went into the store gas station. Um, the attendant would, uh, wouldn't allow, or he was upset that about the cigarettes, you remember that? Okay, yeah. all right. My students are here, come on, help me out. And so he shot up in the air. You know, he had a gun on him and shot up in the air. You wanna speak? Okay. And so we asked a question as, you know, it, it was talked about, it was discussed, like how stupid is that just because you didn't like the price of the cigarettes, but it goes deeper than that. And so um, he may have been stressed at home. Maybe he may have lost his job. So there's a lot of environmental factors that may come into place that um, we need to address to get to the root of. <coughs> Any um, member of our esteemed audience want to weigh in on this causational thing? Got a whole group of them in the back with white shirts back there. Hi, um, my name is Jordan Priestley, uh, second year GRCC criminal justice major. Um, what I've been thinking about this entire time, the causational factors triggering violence was, this isn't the main one I think, but the lack of emotion in my generation, I feel has caused a lot of stuff. Like, instead of going to your neighbors, we just check Facebook and see what's going on. You know, the complete emotion, there's no emotion behind any text. Yeah, an emoji, a smiley face, that could mean nothing. That could mean nothing to anyone. And I feel like we've, I don't know, relied on text messaging and not going to speak or call up your mom and say, hey, I love you, you know? I feel like, I don't know, I feel like the our uprise in technology has kind of in some way made us forget how to interact with other people or problem solve or rationalize. And I feel like for sure technology is def not just media, like simple Facebook, you know, Twitter, texting, even calling. We just, we just don't do that as much as when you said um, back in the day you used to know all your neighbors. That's because you didn't have Facebook and you didn't have texting. But all of us, we have it all. I still don't have Facebook. I don't either. Right. We don't I have really it. Don't. <laughs> but you can text 60 words a day. You have to text or your kids won't communicate with you. Raise your hand if you've ever had a text conversation with somebody sitting right next to you. Hi, um, my name's uh, Corey Meyer. I'd like to say that I really appreciate seeing all of these professors. I've enjoyed a lot of their classes and learned a lot. So thank you all for being here and continuing to teach us, um, and as well as a lot of students that I've had in um, some of my other classes. Um, I just wanted to say I think a big causational factor is the lack of family bonding. Um, I know at my house, I make it a, an effort. I go way out of my way to make sure that my family and my children which are sitting right next to me right here tonight, um, <laughs> sit down at the kitchen table and, and talk about their lives, talk about their, their school day, talk about my school day or my work day with them, um, and really continue to bond. Like the gentleman was talking about back here, you know, he walks his kids or drives his kids to school. You, you, we, we are missing that. We are all <coughs> too busy with our own lives, our own careers, our own education to take the time to really sit down. And um, currently I work at Pine Rest uh, in a, a residential uh, adolescent unit. And um, you know, I, I get a, a face smack on a regular basis, literally, physically, or emotionally from these children that are lacking that family bonding. They have such horrible uh, reactive attachment disorders. They, they really honestly think that the right way to express that their emotion for a significant person in their life is to physically abuse them. You know, if they're angry at me, pardon my French, but they tell me I'm a bitch and then they try to hit me and then five minutes later tell me they love me. And um, unfortunately, I, I hate to say it, but it's a, a big part of it is the lack of bonding towards that mother or that father or that aunt or whoever else is in, was supposed to or 
is important in their life. And um, I think we really need to get down to the root of things and really find out and take time to remember who's important in our lives, our neighbors, our communities. It does take a village to raise a child. And that, does, that child doesn't have to be your biological child. You can come from the worst family in the world and find love for another human being or another child that's right next door, that's right down the street. All of our professors up front have all told us to reach your hand out and, and really and try to take someone and take a moment to pull over and help that you know single mother bring her groceries and her baby home. I, I, we need to get out of that text message mode, and we really need to and reach down and find the love for humanity. I mean, I think that's a huge causational factor. Hi, I'm Janelle. Um, I think a huge causation is like lack of responsibility that we have nowadays. Like a lot of my friends, you know, they're, you know, I'm 22, they're 21, they're 20, and they're pissed that they have to pay rent. Like, dude, for real? You live in your parents' basement, you use their water, you pay, you know, help out. I think our generation, we blame the older generation and then we're waiting for the younger generation to fix the problem. You, we need to be more proactive. We have a problem, let's find a solution. Let's not sit and wait for our kids or their kids to find the solution. We don't want to drop, I don't want to have kids one day and worry that I'm going to drop them off at school and then them not come home. You know, I don't want my kids to have to worry about that. As a generation, we need to be more proactive. We have problems, let's fix it. Let's stop blaming our parents and let's not wait for our kids to find the solution. You want to make the world a better place for your child? Start today. Like, don't, don't wait. Like, we need to be more responsible as a generation. We need a better work ethic. We need a stronger community. And with all, like, what Jordan was saying, with, like, the Facebook, the Twitter, the whatever people do nowadays, it just needs to stop, you know? Like, so my mom refuses to text. I have to call my mom if I need something. My mom will not learn how to text. If I need something from my mom, I have to, like, talk to her. And as big as a pain that is, I love it. The sound of my mom's voice, awesome. Like, a text message just does not satisfy that. You know, my mom taught me responsibility. I have rent, I have bills, he paid them on time. As a generation, we need to be more responsible, and we need to teach that to our kids so they can teach that to our kids, and that's how you build a community, in my mind. <coughs> By the way, that was one of my students. <laughs> 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 and the one behind her. <laughs> I'd like to uh, add um, something that we have to keep in mind. Uh, uh, I uh, hosted the Coffee with the Captain uh, last week, and a lot of the local pastor uh, brought, brought up a, um, a fact that these are not kids who have been committing these uh, murders or these uh, or victims of these uh, shootings. These are young adults. Mm -hmm. They were all over 18 years old. They, every, they actually average between the ages of uh, 21 and 25. So um, I do believe we have to uh, focus on our kids and we have to focus on their education and their well-being. We, we, need, we, have, we still have to address this issue with uh, senseless violence. And again, it's not coming from our kids. Another thing that I wanted to add is um, we, we should control the accessibility to guns, but we have to deal with those issues within those, those people because it's like tearing down the web week after week instead of killing the spider. We get rid of all the guns and let's say they use a mic stand to beat a person to death, get rid of the mic stands. Then it's something else. We got to deal with the real issue with people. There's a lack of leadership in our community. A lot of leaders will jump out when TV's cameras are rolling and the reporters are writing. But when they go home, those reporters and those uh, TV cameras are not rolling, they're nowhere to be found. There's no leadership. And the people in the urban community from where I come from, they just don't trust people because they say they, they don't care. They're not there. So uh, I want to uh, second the notion of uh, mentoring and taking time to be a recognizable face in the community, leaders being recognizable faces, just basic people who are in the community coming outside of those four walls of your home, coming out the four, outside the four walls of your church 
and being in your community and taking ownership in your community. I think that's a great start. Hello. Um, I think it's, uh, well, first of all, I want to say they said in Grand Rapids that gangs just started in Grand Rapids. And one of my professors, I think it was you, Miss Edwards, <laughs> said there's over 200 gangs in Grand Rapids. I'm 30 years old. Gangs been here since I was in elementary. But they're just now making it aware of it. And you got to think about it. With the medical mile coming along, I mean, just to pull something out of the air, with growth, you have plus and minus. You have action and reaction. You want your city to grow, you're going to have some negatives with the growing. You, you got to have awareness. People get in these gangs, they get a felony, then they can't get jobs, then they get bored, then they can't get a job, they want money, they can't get the money, they take it. So that's a spiral effect for, for the violence. Basically people being lazy and they have a want. So if you can nip it in the bud from the get-go, education, jobs, awareness, how to, like people said, interact with your problems and frustrations, uh, defuse a situation before it happens, all the violence, not all, but mo most of some should stop. Hi, my name is Heather Bell. And I am a first year CG, CJ student here. Um, I actually moved to Grand Rapids from Traverse City. So <laughs> I'm from up in Hickville there. <laughs> um, I moved down here knowing that there was probably a chance that violence would affect my family. But I still moved. Um, I can tell you that I lived with a college in my hometown. I never attended because I didn't feel that they really cared about the students. I came down here, I attended GRCC because the professors made me feel like I was gonna get an education that I could then pass down to others. I was a victim of gun violence when I was a teenager. My dad held me at gunpoint. I chose to take that experience and build on it. I didn't wanna retaliate. I did put my, ja my dad in jail but it was to teach him a lesson that he needed to realize that he wasn't as big and bad as he thought he was. And I'll tell you what, I look at my kids, I have a nine-year-old and a six-year-old, and I tell them every day, you be your own person. You build your own life the way you want it. <coughs> if you want to go and spend your life behind bars, then that's what you're going to do. I said, but I want you to know that you have a mom that cares, you have education at your fingertips. If you want it, it's there. Go for it. And my daughter is an A student. But she is very vulnerable to peer pressure. And I'll tell you what, we just had a discussion tonight that she's got to be her own person, and she's still not getting it. <laughs> but I'm going to keep having the same talk with her, and I'm hoping to <coughs> get involved in the community and do the same with others. I have 12 nieces and nephews that are teenagers right now. They're a handful, but I love them. And I will smack them in the back of the head when they step out of line. <laughs> so, <laughs> but they still come talk to me. You know, um, my nephew got, a, got involved in drugs, came and talked to me, quit talking to me for a while because I went to his parents. <laughs> but now he's in the Navy and we're very proud of him. That's what I want to do. I want to reach out and I want to help other teens that have that same problem and younger. And I think that Grand Rapids has the potential to do great things. My name's Adam Balf. I actually come from, uh, not, I'm not from Grand Rapids, never attended here until I started the GRCC Academy. Um, come from a small town out near St. John's. Um, we hear this mass, of, you know, the media is always talking about guns, 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 too many guns around here. Um, I don't think guns are the issue. It's, I mean, when I was young, I always had eight or ten guns accessible, but my parents taught me, you don't touch them. 
you know, I wasn't 14 or 15 year old thinking, oh, I can run and grab a gun if somebody bullies me on the playground. Um, I feel like it's, you know, like this young lady in front of me said, you know, it starts in your family. It starts you teaching your kids. You know, my, my grandpa, you know, murdered my grandma when, you know, before I was born. But my mom sat down with me when I was five or six years old and told me all about guns. We still had guns in the house. It didn't mean that all these mass killings were going to start from the guns, but she sat there and told me, hey, you don't touch them. You know, this is something that's it's deadly. It's the same thing when you get behind the wheel of a car. So, I mean, I feel like, I feel like the guns and the majority of the guns aren't the problem. It's, you know, it starts right in our, in our families. So, that's my opinion. Hello, my name's uh, Lawrence Robinson. And as far as with um, causations, I agree with most of the panel. Uh, but for my opinion, I think uh, the mental health issue is the biggest because um, I've subbed in the Grand Rapids Public Schools for like seven years. And um, I specifically go to the schools in my area, which, um, with the, which is in the southeast side, um, Mulek, Shawnee, just uh, not Shawnee, but Mulek campus, um, Ottawa Hills, and primarily uh, schools with minorities and um, socially economic poor people. And one thing I notice uh, when I do go to, for instance, a kindergarten class, um, there's mental issue problems. Um, you look at the causation, uh, there's a cause from these problems, which are the single parent um, homes, um, the mothers that's been addicted to, whether it's crack or heroin or meth methamphetamines. And I just think we need to put, as criminal justice majors and as students, uh, faculty, we need to do a more push for uh, policy because without policy, we cannot make anything happen. Um, we can't enforce, we can't put more cops on the street to enforce um, crimes when needed. Um, and looking at like a 12th grader, you can see from kindergarten to 12th grade, the development, we lose them somewhere. We lose them um, middle school somewhere. Um, a lot of them are lost by the sixth grade. So I think we just have to become aware and um, support um, mental health more because as we know, mental health, we really haven't, um, and I, I can't speak for any other country, but in America, we haven't put that as a forefront um, for our students um, to just even pretty much give a base of where to start because Everyone's not uh, crazy. Let me just um, restate that. These students um, coming up, they have issues. It's not that they're bad. It's not that they're uh, just, they can't be controlled. There's chemical imbalances. Because if, you're, if you are a crack baby, most likely you do have some chemical imbalances. That's all I want to say, just um, make awareness of uh, mental health. Uh, my name's Samantha, and um, I think another big problem is uh, teaching our youth problem-solving skills. A lot of these crimes that are being committed are for reasons that we would think of as trivial. The price of cigarettes, throwing a snowball. If we teach people how to deal with the issues starting at childhood, they'll know when they get to be 17, 18 years old and start having to deal with them on a regular basis. Even my generation, a lot of them don't know how to deal with their life. Once they're kicked out of their home, that's, they don't know what to do. They rely on their parents way too much. If we start teaching children at a young age how to deal with life, how to make choices, how to make the right choices, it could solve a lot of problems, I think, so that's all. The, uh, the good news about uh, scripted questions is that sometimes what happens is they get answered before we get there. And so I'm going to throw a little curveball. We're going to deal with this one says, what solutions can we offer our community to help prevent? 
But there's a word that several people used here is that we have lots of resources. And I think we'd be remiss tonight without mentioning what some of those are. So while you're thinking here, um, I'm going to ask each one to talk about what would you do to prevent it and also list maybe one or two of your favorite resources. In return, what we'll do is, I believe, if things are working, um, this, this is all being videotaped here, I'll go back and we'll grab all of these resources and besides the video, if you want to go and look at a segment, we'll have a list of those resources which are at least the panel's favorite for dealing with some of the violence that might be available right here in West Michigan and Grand Rapids. So, somebody have a, have a thought already, you ready to go? You can't throw them, you can't change it. It's called old age, so. Okay. Okay. You know, it's not gun violence, but, um, you know, one of the things that we've talked about has been what kind of things cause other kinds of things. So I'm going to throw out domestic violence. I have a favorite resource. Um, there's a, a couple of them. You know, obviously there's some domestic violence programs that run through the Y, um, but there is one that's run by the 61st District Court. It's called the Domestic Assault Response Team. Um, it, it goes to the scene of every domestic violence case, if the police officer calls them um, in the city of Grand Rapids, assists the victim, um, takes them to shelter, gives them emergency food, um, has a food pantry, buys diapers, you know, essentially provides some really good resources to the victim of that domestic violence so that they don't immediately go back to the perpetrator or don't have to immediately go back because so much of it's an economic issue. And also provides a lot of crisis counseling so that hopefully you make a better decision about whether or not you want to continue or expose your own kids to that violent situation. There's my favorite resource. Well, and, and you're, you're too humble, Jan, because we should, un, we should basically say you started that program back in the 61st District Court, I understand? That's correct. And also, just for, <laughs> just for educational purposes, I know that I've had lots of students who have volunteered and you go through some thorough training. Can you talk about the opportunities? to touch someone even while sitting and going to school? You know, I, part, of the, part of the funding for the domestic assault response <coughs> requires volunteer hours. So if any of you are ever thinking about, you know, where am I going to do my internship? How am I going to do something in a, maybe a non-traditional criminal justice area? Keep it in mind because it exposes you to working with police officers to shelter people, also working with a lot of victims. They have to have volunteer hours. They work at night. They work during the day. So it becomes something that fits somebody's schedule very well. They work in the courtrooms. So it can take multiple people. You go to court with some people. And, and yeah, you know, as Gary mentioned, sure, it's a program I started. And I have to tell you, it's probably one of the ones that I'm the most proud of, you know, in terms of doing it, because I think it's touched an awful lot of victims. I think. Many of us can attest to when we've gotten into trouble in our lives, much of it can be attributed to boredom, no meaningful outlet. It's by the grace of God that I'm a cop because I used to get into a hell of a lot of trouble. And I remember the times that I did get in trouble, I was not doing anything meaningful. I didn't have a positive outlet. The Boys and Girls Clubs of Greater Grand Rapids, and we have two specific centers at the Seedman Center and at the Style Center. And then there's other programs, Rep or Recreation Reaps Rewards, the Croc Center down on the southwest side, are all meaningful outlets for youth in our society, uh, specifically Grand Rapids. There are similar outlets nationwide. We need to link uh, our youth to these programs. And much of them are centered around athletics, but there are other outlets as well uh, tied to other recreational activities, mentoring, homework clubs, uh, all of those, uh, I think, will provide for young people, for students, um, outlets that will create uh, situations in which their time is um, used in a meaningful manner, as opposed to being bored out in the street and hatching some harebrained plan to create mayhem, which I did when I was young. And second of all, and I know this is somewhat difficult for much of our society, and particularly this, the community I work in, is a resource is the police. And, and, I, and I realize there's an adversarial relationship oftentimes, and I understand the historical perspective of law enforcement in our society with, with respect to certain 
um, segments of our society. But I think we do a fairly decent job in solving the problems of our community. Do we have our problems here in Grand Rapids? Absolutely. Um, are there police officers that are not the most respectful? Certainly. Um, but please rely on us. Don't feel apprehensive to call the police, to give us information. And, and that's really part of the crux of this problem is that um, we've become all too tolerant, like I've said before, and there's a lack of trust within our community in the way some of these problems can be dealt with. But if we deal with it uh, in as a community and get the police involved with some of these problems, we can help stem the tide of violence. Um, lastly, I just want to say we've talked a lot about males in our, in our community. In the last six to seven years, I've seen a proliferation of female violence. Um, when girls used to fight, um, again, I'm dating myself a little bit, uh, it was uh, uh, chirping back and forth, a little backstabbing, a little uh, uh, talking. Now, the way I see girls fight and interact with each other is completely different. They're emulating uh, their, their male role models, if you will, or their male counterparts. Um, I, I think we're going to lose a lot with respect to this issue if we don't uh, include females in our discussion. Um, as far as a community organizations or one that I would say is best, I think that anyone that is trying to make a difference or a change is best. I think that lately with a lot of the violence that has been going on, you have a lot more of resources that are becoming available. With the Beyond the Violence, I was on the news the other day, they listed tons of organizations, Stop the Violence. You have so many um, churches in the community now that are actually stepping up and, and, and doing something. And then you have organizations that have been around. You have Big Brothers, Big Sisters, and things like that. Anything that you can take a part of and make a difference and make a change in someone's life, to me, that I'm all for it. Um, it doesn't matter your race, your sex, or anything like that. It, it, you, can, you can make a difference. So to me, if any organization is working for the better of our community, I think that's a good organization. I have a resource that is one of my favorites. It's actually a group called CLEAR. That's an acronym for Coalition Leadership, Education, and Rehabilitation. It is a partnership between our, our reentry program here in Kent County and actually Grand Rapids Police Department. Uh, co facilitate a group with uh, uh, Terry Dixon, a police officer, and former uh, Lieutenant Ralph Mason and Pastor Blakely in the back there. Every Thursday at Bates Place from 9 to 11. And, and what we do is we facilitate a discussion for with any male that's in, at risk for any form of violence. And uh, it's led by and large by men who've been released from prison. We have individuals, uh, leaders in this program that have served over 50 years in Michigan's prison. We have a couple of folks, uh, the vast majority, they've been incarcerated between 15 and 30 years, and they come every single Thursday uh, at Bates Place, which is a, a, a building between Bates and Franklin attached to First CRC Church. And it has been one of the most eye-opening programs that I've ever seen on either side because uh, it, it, it has living, breathing, what we call uh, returning citizens, men who've been returned back to our community, uh, actually discussing uh, the way forward with their lives with young folks. We go to alternative directions and we bring the men uh, from there every day, I mean every Thursday to the program. Uh, we facilitate employment with the Recycle Center here in Kent County. Uh, and, and many other different uh, programs that we do. But this has fast become a resource in our community. Uh, sometimes we call it our best kept secret because many folks have never heard about it. Uh, but each and every Thursday we're there, we're full, uh, we have a nice meal, uh, and it's just, we invite folks from the community college from every aspect of our community. And it's great to see law enforcement interacting with former, what we call returning citizens. Uh, twice a month we take the same group back into Ionia Bellamy Creek Prison and actually talk about their experiences that they had um, after they were released from prison. So that's a great resource. 
two resources that uh, I come into contact with because I have clients who have attended them or have referred them there. Uh, we speak about mental health, and uh, that's a, a whole discussion unto itself, but Network 180 uh, has been uh, a good program. Thank you. has been an excellent program, and although it's not a perfect program, it, it, it serves uh, a, a good segment of the population who require those services. Uh, the Salvation Army uh, program is also another excellent program. Um, I've had individuals that are not only there full time, but they have a day reporting center where they can go on a daily basis and check in. Uh, Mel Trotter Ministries uh, is an excellent organization uh, downtown serving uh, an underserved population, to be, to be quite honest. So those are just a few that off the top of my mind, off the top of my head, I should say, that uh, I, can, I can recommend and put forth. Um, just to <clears throat> name a few more, um, some of the other programs or resources, um, I know Neyland Avenue Church, some of our, a lot of our church or programs, um, churches, area churches have a lot of youth programs that are made available for um, not just um, the youth, but also for the parents um, and adults. So there's a lot of resources there. I know Neyland Avenue Church does a lot with the community. Um, also, um, Urban Ministries, uh, which is located, um, I, I believe it's affiliated with Calvary um, Church, and they bus um, or transport um, kids within the Greater Grounds area um, to their church, and there's a lot of um, resources that are available to help. Um, also, um, Young Life, which is a men's group um, that is um, provided or is now being advertised in some of the schools, um, the school settings. Um, there's many camps. Um, someone already, already mentioned the Croc Center. Um, the YWCA, they have a girls program. It used to be called Girls Inc. Um, I'm not sure. Um, um, and I know that they work with girls ranging from 12 to 17 and maybe younger, um, but the Girls Inc. program at the YWCA. So there's a lot of resources, again, um, that are made available. And then um, if you all want to be a part of the solution, I would say, again, and challenge you all, to get involved, to volunteer. Um, I know one of the things that they're doing um, in regards to if you want to volunteer like in your local school, uh, elementary, middle school, or high school, all you have to do is simply complete a background check. That's it. You don't have to have any kids or any family, but just have the heart and the passion. And um, you can volunteer in the local schools in the local schools. Um, there's also food pantries that are made available um, to assist families. Um, also, um, the Urban League, which is located right in the heart of Grand Rapids, that, are also, that is also made available. But if you all want to help, volunteer. Volunteer in your local communities in your school. Thank you. Thank you. I don't, um, I don't know if some of you noticed or not, but um, one of the advantages of being the last one on the list um, for the symposium here is the fact that we get to change the rules. And we kind of did an audible, uh, the members of the Criminal Justice Department. And if you notice, it was, it, was, um, it was published as a symposium on gun violence. And we kind of pulled that gun and put it aside and talked about violence. And I think what we have here is uh, the fact that Guns are one avenue of violence that we deal with. Yes, it's come to the forefront because of some of the mass shootings and the dialogue from the national level on down. But as the good uh, pastor said back down there, going, if we find a way to take all the guns off the street, they're going to find something else to, 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 to use as a weapon and so forth. So violence in and of itself is, is the topic. But I don't want to sell anybody short. If you came here passionately to talk about guns here, um, I wanted to make sure that we acknowledge that, that we knew what we did, um, and if you've got something for us, um, um, that uh, you should probably raise your hand here. So, so there's a couple of them. Hang on a second. Yeah, we, they say I'm loud too. 
I just wanted to say it, it's been fascinating and I really appreciate the opportunity to come and listen to all of the different points of views. But we still, I firmly believe, we've talked a lot about what um, the different root causes and triggers of violence are. But we still have to remember that guns and firearms are still the most common and the most lethal instrument that's being used in the violence. And they, the guns still remain one of the least regulated products on, in our American market. That has to be part of the discussion. It really does. And I totally agree. People will hurt each other with a, a chair, anything. But when you're in that moment of despair, domestic violence, anger, whatever it is, and you have one gun, 10 guns. I'm not saying take away all guns, believe me. I, am, I think we can be respectful of the Second Amendment. But when you're in that moment of despair and you're angry, it's so much easier to take a life with a gun that's sitting right there and is available. And I think that has to be part of the discussion that we've allowed 310 million guns to flood our, our, our country. They're everywhere. And that has to be part of the discussion. And that has to make a difference. We've regulated every other product on the market. Mothers Against Drunk Driving, we have limits. We've accepted limits, speed limits. We're not allowed. We can't say we want to speed and go 200 miles an hour. There's laws against that. There has to be some discussion of what the impact of just the sheer volume and ease of access to guns is and how it impacts violence in our country. Thank you. Uh, uh, my name is Tom Jones. I actually graduated from here in uh, uh, 2010. But uh, well, yes, yesterday's thing wasn't so good. The first one was good. Today was mostly good. But uh, well, m well uh, some of the stuff, you know, you know, it, it's, it's, everybody's got a different opinion. But as far as guns go, I think there's probably a lot more uh, drunk drivers and people committing crimes with cars than there are with guns in this country. Uh, December 7, 2005, I was leaving a hunting spot, and the guy went off the road and ran me and my dog over on purpose in Montcalm County. Uh, I mean, he went nine feet off the road, hit my dog, skidded 150 feet, went another 30 feet, bounced off a tree to a stop, and he did not get a ticket. Uh, the, the cop showed up about an hour late, and he was buddies with the guy, and he fell out of the police report, so I ran out of the woods and knocked the guy's car off the road. So basically speaking, I had a civil suit where I basically sued myself, which is great because I had insurance and they didn't have hardly any. And so I got a little pittance and it's on this record that I testified that he killed my dog on purpose. And that's probably all I'll ever get out of it. And I went to two attorney generals with a false police report that the cop filled out and I got nowhere. So, uh, at any rate, there's a lot more problem, issues and problems with it than just guns in this country. And it would, you know, and so I guess that's basically uh, all I want to say. Oh, but people don't need 30 round clips. But it would be nice if people would stop making the 30 round clips because I figure, well, anyone who's been near a gun store, we got record gun sales right now. On, on, it was off the charts. You can't hardly get near you go, you go to a hardware store, there's all kinds of people buying these. The, the people that you, you least want to have guns are buying guns. So, but at any rate, thanks. Well, thank you for uh, your comments because you actually, I, that's the reason they wouldn't let me up on the stage tonight because as soon as this came up I wanted to talk about drunk drivers because they claim more lives but this is the dialogue we have tonight. I think we got a new subject for the next time, right? We got time for one more to keep within our time. I got a, I got a microphone right now, so I'm, gonna go <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I just, it was given to me so I figured I'll just go ahead and go. <laughs> um, I just want to co curtail what um, the young lady just said earlier, she was saying that uh, the gun should be the forefront of the conversation, and that was what most of us came here for tonight. But I just want to note that it's so easy to say, let's regulate guns. And it probably is as far as making sure they're registered and the proper people have them. But the toughest part of regulating guns is manpower. It requires more policing. It requires more people on the street to, to respond to these. But from what I'm reading, more cops are coming off of the street than cops that are going onto the street. So sign more millages, get more cops on the street, and that may impact the guns on the street. So that was just my point on that. One more, so that was one more of mine.
Okay. Okay. Uh, you, you each get 30 seconds. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm Chester Lowe, and I uh, have been um, with uh, Community Action Program uh, in the past, which is no longer here, and I was a youth coordinator. And some of the um, issues that we look at uh, having to do with guns and violence in the community, I think you're, you're touching on all the good points. I think there are a few points that haven't been brought forth, or I should say a couple points. Um, one did touch on it, it had to do with egotism. A lot of the shooting, a lot of the violence that goes on, whether shooting, stabbing, hitting, uh, even driving, has to do with the ego. People who are hurt for one reason or another mentally or emotionally take it out on uh, people in the streets or in their uh, homes or even in schools. Uh, it's uh, something that needs to be dealt with. Another has to do with another E, which is employment or economics. When you don't have income and you're um, not allowed to be employed uh, for one reason or another, and you're economically deprived or challenged, you become violent. Yeah, I mean, not necessarily all the time, but most people do. Now, how do we solve that kind of issue or problem? I think it takes, um, like you say, a village. And sometimes we have to deal with the way laws have been made or regulations are, have uh, developed, uh, preventing people from being employed, preventing people from uh, feeling good about themselves, which is the ego egotistical part. And we had programs to deal with that in the past. I don't know what happened to them when I was away for the 20 years. I'm back now from Pittsburgh. In Pittsburgh, we had situations like that too. And we had programs reaching out in the community and inviting people in. They were drop-in centers. You don't have that here. I don't know why. That's, that's one thing. Uh, we used to have it here. It was called switchboard, but it wasn't a drop-in center. It was a calling center that you can call into, and they had a whole big book of uh, referrals, places to go to. I, and I know because I worked there. I was, I was a, a phone counselor there with them while I was in school at Grand Valley. Boy, I'm surprised it's no, no longer here now because that would have been very instrumental and helpful in the issues or preventing the situations that did occur that we're here for now. Finally, I just want to say um, for all the things that's happened to uh, get people in trouble, and now coming out and uh, trying to uh, be what we call reentry. I work with, I volunteer with a program called the Criminal Justice Chaplaincy. Now, that is very important to have in order to prevent people from going back in prison who are trying to get out or stay out. That's one thing I didn't hear anybody say or mention, and some of you in here may have heard of them. It's at 207 Fulton, down the street here. And I think it's very important for me uh, to get involved with in order to prevent the kind of crimes that has happened in the past, whether violent or thievery or whatever it was. So uh, the cr criminal justice chaplaincy could be found on the internet. I don't know exactly what to look up except criminal justice chaplaincy of Grand Rapids, Michigan. And they're also uh, in conjunction with the base place. So that's all I can say now. Thank you very much. Um, this concludes um, our night hosting the symposium um, from the criminal justice perspective. Know that your time and your comments have been extremely valued by us. Uh, to my understanding, a video will be available of this evening, probably within the next 24 to 48 hours. And um, please don't just let it stay on YouTube, go back to it and begin to pull from it. Be inspired by it. Um, you guys were um, extremely inspiring tonight. And so again, we thank our panel. Give them a hand of, uh, a round of applause. <laughs> know, that, know that you all have the best